بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد I wanted to give a relatively brief talk because I really want to save some time for Q&A. Uh, the topic is very near and dear to all of us sitting in this room. That's why we're here. I think every one of us knows someone who's gone through a crisis of faith, perhaps even someone who's no longer a Muslim. I think all of us have had that painful realization one day, oh my God, so-and-so, did he actually do that or say that? Did he actually renounce or whatnot? And subhanAllah, we are seeing more and more people question and doubt uh, their faith and become either agnostic or, 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 or atheist or whatnot. And the fact of the matter is that very few of us are really qualified to deal with this phenomenon. When you go and study Islam or when you, this is not, you're not trained to deal with the types of problems that our youth come up to me and other scholars with. And I want to just give some broad outlines. SubhanAllah, just recently I was discussing with somebody uh, who openly became murtad, but he was a very, uh, a very active person in his community. Uh, he was a youth counselor. He was a regular at the masjid. And then all of a sudden he just you know, dropped out for a year. And then he announced that he's no longer a Muslim. Somebody connected me with this brother. We had a very long back and forth. And it was the standard questions. Why does Islam allow this? How could the Quran say this? Why did the Prophet ﷺ do that? All of these questions about issues that he is finding ethically problematic about the Quran about the Sunnah, about the Seerah. So, today I'm going to just very briefly touch about how do we understand this phenomenon. Realize, my dear brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with three primarily, primary needs or faculties, if you like. The physical needs, the spiritual needs, and the intellectual needs. We have, number one, physical needs. And so, physical, we need to eat, we need to drink, we need air. If we, if we don't have these, these things, we're going to die. Number two, we also have spiritual needs. And these spiritual needs must also be fulfilled. If they are not fulfilled, then what happens? Many things. First and foremost, depression. Secondly, meaninglessness. Just living your life carpe diem for the moment. You just feel empty. You don't have a higher goal in life. Right? And therefore, if you don't have a higher goal, you create a goal and you make it the highest goal. And that is why in our times there are so many causes that people are so passionate about. Things that were not that important 100, 500, 1000 years ago. Whether it's ethical issues, environmental issues, animal issues. But people need a higher goal for which they want to dedicate their life to. It's in fact ingrained in us to do so. And Islam of course answers to that situation, a spiritual need. And then there's an intellectual need as well. That your intellect needs to be satisfied, your, your curiosity needs to be met. So you have the physical, the spiritual and the intellectual. And Islam comes with... Enough for all three of these things That it tells you how to live your life physically It tells you how to live your life spiritually And it gives you the answers for the meaningful questions Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Why did, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, create me? Now the problem comes The problem comes when we take one of these three functions And use them to trump the others Make it the end all and be all and in particular in our times, it's the issue of rationality. It's the issue of using our intellects or our brain to try to understand even the minutiae of Islam. And if we don't understand it, well then we end up rejecting the entire religion of Islam. Now, am I saying that there are certain things in Islam that are irrational? No, I'm not saying this. Islam does not come with anything that is irrational. But it does come with things that are supra-rational, i.e. rationality does not and cannot have a role to judge whether it's valid or not. It's beyond the scope of the intellect. Islam does not come with anything that contradicts the intellect. But it comes with things that the intellect might not necessarily understand, even if it does not find illogical. Is that clear? There are things beyond the scope of realm of reason, of, 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 of intellect, of aql, we call it in Arabic. And Islam will tell you these things. And it is possible your mind will not fully comprehend, but Islam will never tell you something that goes against, that contradicts the mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with. And when you look at the questions that 
these young men and women, and they're almost always young men and women, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, when they're going through this crisis of faith up to the early 20s, when you look at the questions that these young men and women ask, they inevitably center around a, a core group of issues, all of which are modern, all of which are emanating from within a particular cultural paradigm. In other words, the questions that people of our generation are asking never even occurred to the last generation or the generation before them or the generation before them all the way back to uh, the Prophet ﷺ and before. These are questions that modern society is positing. Questions about the existence of God, sexuality and orientation, gender roles. These things did not exist. Society by and large accepted these things as truths. And a hundred years from now, the questions that then those generations of Muslims will be asking will be completely unknown of, unthought of by the generations of our times. So, instead of being so quick to question Islam, take a step back and be just as questioning of your own questions and where they're emanating from. Instead of just jumping at the Qur'an and saying, why does the Qur'an say this? Take a step back before you get there and ask yourself, why am I asking this particular question and not another one that perhaps 500 or 1,000 years ago was at the forefront of uh, people's minds? And when you start contextualizing yourself, look, you and I, both of us, we are products of a particular civilization of a particular code of conduct, ethics, morality, of a particular paradigm. We are living and born and raised in a particular context. And the questions that are being spoon-fed to us by the context that we live in, we also should be brave enough to challenge those questions. Why are we not brave enough to challenge those questions even as we're brave enough to challenge the Qur'an? Those questions will change. The Qur'an will remain, as we know, unchanged. And uh, the topic of, of intellect, the topic of the role of reason is a very detailed topic and I mean just FYI, uh, my, my PhD dissertation from, from Yale was about the role of reason and intellect in Islam. That was the whole dissertation was about uh, how, how to reconcile or in particular how Ibn Taymiyyah reconciled reason and revelation in Islam and it's a very fascinating topic because in that work, this great theologian Ibn Taymiyyah, he actually critiques this notion that reason alone will always arrive at the truth. And he brings forth such beautiful examples. First and foremost, the impossibility of even defining what is reason, what is rational, what is intellectual. What might be intellectual for us was not intellectual a generation ago. What might be rational for us was not rational a hundred years ago. Rationality itself changes from society to time to place. And there, there is nothing that we can judge rationality by in and of itself. In fact, in our own lives, how many times have we undertaken a course of action thinking this is so logical, this is so reasonable, reasonable, this is so the correct decision. And the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, we look back and we say, what a dumb decision I made. How could I have been thinking that? Isn't We ourselves experience this. So how then can we take quote-unquote reason to be something above and beyond anything, always deriving ultimate truths from that? Now does this mean, as I said, that Islam has nothing to do with reason? No, not at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to think, to ponder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an to make tafakkur, tadabbur, tadhakkur of his signs. But if you look at the Qur'anic commands to think and reflect. The Qur'an never challenges Allah's revelation. The Qur'an never tells you challenge Allah's revelation. Rather, the Qur'an addresses non-Muslims and says, think, is Islam true or not? Think, is the Prophet true or not? Think, if this, is this book, the Qur'an, from Allah or not? Once you come to the conclusion that the Qur'an is the book from Allah, that the Prophet Muhammad is a true Prophet, that's where you use your mind. Once you admit and submit that the Qur'an is the, 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 the book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are not supposed to question each and every minutia and law and wisdom. We will never understand why we pray five times a day and not four or six times. There's no 
clear-cut answer we can give. We will never understand why we perform wudu in a certain manner, why we have to do one ruku' and two sajdas in every rak'ah. It might not be something that is fully understood rationally, but neither is it irrational. It's not against reason. It's there, you just submit. Now, if somebody were to say, I don't understand the wisdom in five, well, tough luck. You've accepted the Qur'an, we're assuming you have accepted the Qur'an. You've accepted the Qur'an, you must accept it as a package deal. So, reason has a role and, and a place. And what is the role and place of reason? To guide you to the fact that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam is a prophet. And the Qur'an is the book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you submit to that, then you accept the package deal. And if you look at the questions that these young men and women ask, they're always about fiqh issues of a relatively minor nature. Why does Islam allow this? Why does, uh, why does the Quran say that? And they're all things to do of a legal nature. They're not to do with the basics or the essence of theology. And we do not judge the validity of a religion based upon the minutiae laws. We don't judge a religion, how can Islam be true when we have to pray five times a day? That's not how we judge Islam. We judge Islam based on what? On theology, on purpose of life, on the fact that the Qur'an is a book from Allah. The miracle of the Qur'an, which is a separate topic. Once we've established that these things are true, we then accept the message as it is. We don't, we don't have the luxury of tinkering with the message itself. And therefore... If we rely too much on these questions and think that our mind itself will be able to answer it, then we are doomed to fail. Because I will never be able to explain to you every single detail of Islam, right? And we have to realize that we should think about the questions themselves and where they're emanating from, and perhaps the questions themselves are flawed. And I want to give you just one simple example that the right always uses, Islamophobes always use, uh, and they make a very big deal of it. And that is, they say, for example, oh, uh, your, your prophet, astaghfirullah, was, and they use a very vulgar word, uh, interested in young people, and I don't want to use the word out of respect for the Prophet because the age of Aisha was uh, young age. It was nine years old in the Sahih Bukhari hadith. Okay, she was nine years old according to Hadith of Bukhari. And so they use a very vulgar word. And I've had young men and women come to me, Muslims, and they say, how can we accept this? This is something that is vulgar. It's unethical. I can't believe that a prophet would do this. Now, this person, and this is a classic example. This question is emanating from a particular mind, coming from a particular culture of a particular generation and a particular time and a particular place. The worst enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, who smeared him with everything imaginable. They couldn't even think of this as a flaw. Why? Because cultures vary. Practices vary. And it's not just Islamic or Arab culture. The reality is, 500, 1000 years ago, the world over, people were marrying at younger ages. Why? Because the lifespan was shorter and young kids became mature faster. A nine-year-old of uh, uh, 1400 years ago is like a 16, 17 year old intellectually and biologically of our times. So when we say nine, we are back projecting our nine-year-old of uh, 2014, you know, Detroit, imagining a nine-year-old girl and then back projecting that into Medina and saying, oh, how could our process and marry somebody that's nine? See, this is a cultural bias. Go do the research. In some states to this day, I'm from one of them, Tennessee, you can marry people at the age of 14 or 15. Right? It's not magical the age of 18. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, the average age of getting married was in your teen. Uh, 500 even more so, Romeo and Juliet. When Romeo and Juliet was written, do you know the age of Romeo and Juliet in the Shakespeare's play? Romeo and Juliet are supposed to be 14 and 13 years old. And that's why they had 14 and 13 year old actors play Romeo and Juliet. Now in our times, if Romeo and Juliet were 14 and 13, they'd go to, to, to jail for, for pedophilia or something like this, right? You don't, but look, when Shakespeare's writing, and Shakespeare's only 500 years ago, Romeo and Juliet are supposed to be 14 and 13 because of his era, 14 and 13 is like our era, 18 and 17. If this is something 500 years ago, and subhanAllah, not even 500, again, go look back in this country, in this country in the 1800s, early 1900s, the average age of marriage was uh, early 20s to teens, in this country. 
And this is in America. In many other countries to this day, the age of marriage is still much younger. And I don't mind telling you this. My own grandmother, and she was born in British India, my own grandmother got married at the age of 14. She was 14 years old when, my, when, when she got ma ma married. And I remember talking to her as she's passed away, Allah I remember asking her like, and I was at the time 17, 18, so I couldn't imagine getting married at 14. And I said, how could you get married at 14? And she was like, son, beta, you know, everybody got married at that age. All my friends, we all got married at that age. And this is 1920s British India. We're not talking about, you know, a thousand years ago. So for us to be so gung-ho, so passionate, how could our Prophet have done this? SubhanAllah, who should we blame first? Our own intellect or the seerah of the Prophet And of course, this leads us to the issue of how do we respond to these charges? And there are many Muslims, they just don't understand and they buckle under the pressure and they start, you know, figuring out, well, Aisha was actually 18. Very convenient because 18 is the age of marriage here. I'm pretty sure 100 years from now when the age is raised to 1920, automatically Aisha's age will miraculously rise up to 1920. That's not the way to answer these questions. Aisha never complained. She was the happiest wife in the world. She loved the, the marriage of the Prophet She loved the Prophet She's not angry. She's not complaining. This is a 1,400-year-old culture. Now, nobody's saying we need to resurrect that in our times. And I don't have any problem as a faqih, as a theologian, as an imam to say, okay, in our age, a nine-year-old girl does not qualify to get married. We have to wait till she's older. No problem. Many ulama are saying that. But for us to feel this complex... And then we have young people coming up to us, how could Islam allow X? Why does the Quran say Y? Take a step back and ask yourself, why am I asking this question? Where is this question emanating from? Perhaps my own understanding should be questioned before uh, questioning the Quran and Sunnah. Also realize that, as I said, Islam caters to more than just intellectual questions. Far more profound, Islam caters to our inner core spirituality. And in Arabic, that's called the fitrah. The innate subconsciousness that Allah created us upon. We have inside of us some innate subconsciousness. Something that Allah put inside every human being. It's called the fitrah. As our Prophet ﷺ said, every child is born upon the fitrah. Every child has this fitrah. What is the fitrah? The fitrah is a source of intuitive knowledge. It's not knowledge that is gained by society, taught to you, spoon-fed to you. You are born knowing certain facts. For example, right from wrong, morality from immorality. Every child knows, every young man and woman knows that to be good is good and to be bad is bad. When you lie, when you cheat, when you steal, that's not good. They know it because it's in the fitrah. When you're kind to the poor, it's something ingrained in us, you feel good about it. And the fitrah also tells us that there is a God and that God is one and he is worthy of being worshipped. So the Muslim does not need to intellectually analyze each and every law in the Quran and Sunnah because his inner conscience is at ease that Islam is true. That inner conscience, the fitrah, will tell him this is a correct religion. And once the fitrah gives him this knowledge, then there should be an acceptance of the minutiae of the, of the more tertiary laws. Now, again, I want to be very clear. I am not saying that Islam doesn't tell us to think. I am saying we don't base the validity on Islam based on the age of Aisha, based on why does a man allow this, why does a woman have to cover, why is inheritance this. These are laws, and you might not understand them. Now, by the way, there are ways to answer every question. Every single question that somebody asks, you could attempt an answer, but some of them are not going to be satisfying. And rather going down this infinite maze and loop and answering every question, take a step back and challenge your own understanding. Challenge your own paradigm before you challenge the Quran and the Sunnah. And the last point that I want to say, and my time is up here, is that if you meet such a person who is having some doubts and whatnot, always tell this person, look, there's one thing that we don't lose me and you, both of us. And that is to sincerely call out to the one who created you, to guide you, and I will do the same. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. That the power of dua, never underestimate it. That if you are in doubt, tell this brother, this sister, if you're really in doubt, then continue to make sincere prayer. Because you're not going to lose anything. If you think there's no God, what do you lose by sincerely praying? And if there is a God, then clearly this God will hear you. And we have a very clear belief in our religion. And that is, whoever wants to be guided, will be guided. Allah does not play games. 
Allah does not put traps for the one who is sincerely wants the Salat al-Mustaqim. So if this person is sincere, and I told this brother as well who I was speaking with, and I still consider him a brother in humanity, and I pray that Allah guides him. I told this brother, we had a long back and forth. In the end, and I wasn't able to answer each and every question, I gave him the generics. In the end, I said, look, I am confident that if you are sincere, you will come back to the deen, and insha'Allah ta'ala, me and you will be praying together and giving lectures together one day, insha'Allah ta'ala. And if you are not sincere, then every single answer that I give you, you will find loopholes because for every why, there's a why not. And for every if, there's a but. And for every and, because there's an and. And there's an infinite loop over and over again. And there comes a point in time where you simply have to say, you know what? I know this man, the Prophet Sassam, to be a prophet. His lifestyle, his message, his teachings. I know the Qur'an. I hear the Qur'an and I know it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I speak this as a half of the Qur'an, as a believer in the Qur'an. Wallahi, I hear the Qur'an and I know this is a book from Allah. Just the way it moves me, the way the, the, the resonance, the sound, the words, and this book cannot be from a human being. That's all I need to know. I, don't, I might not be able to answer every single minutiae. But when I know the Qur'an is the book of Allah and the Prophet is the Prophet of Allah, then Alhamdulillah, I submit after that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide me and you and all of us to that which He loves and is pleased with. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.